Hello there, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture, or ATC as the hip kids are calling it these days. Over the last few weeks, we've been having some awkward conversations. This is awkward. Which have largely centered on human sexuality and sexual purity through a biblical lens. But a question I received is, how do we address these issues when it comes to people who don't hold the scripture at all? Who in no way, shape, or form believe that the Bible is authoritative? How do we persuasively engage with them and argue our position without merely quoting the Bible at them? We'll address all of that and more on ATC. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your hip apologist today as we appropriate some culture. So here's the question that I received that I want to tackle. I was thinking more on how to talk with people who don't believe in authority of scripture about the gender fluid thing. There are a few people I know who have wanted to engage with me in conversation, but shut down anything I say from God's word. I love them and realize, first of all, their arguments come from having family members that identify as they, them. I was thinking that scripture aside, how to even begin the conversation from simply natural law leaving the authority of scripture out of it since they dismiss it anyway and shut down anything I say. It's a great question, but let's start off by reinforcing what the Bible does say. Genesis. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So two things are clearly expressed. Human beings are created in the image of God, and so are distinct in creation. And human beings are created with distinct categories of male and female. That was the creative intention of God. And it says in Deuteronomy, a woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing, for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Now this is kind of interesting because what is and isn't men's or women's clothing is cultural. The fashions have changed over time. There was a time in which women wearing pants would have been considered unfeminine. Does that mean Hillary Clinton traipsing around in pantsuits is sinful? Well, yeah, but not for that reason. Fashion changes, and though it might be sensible that Christians ought not to be the avant-garde of fashion disruption, uh, Diane Keaton dressing tomboyishly is not the same thing as Diane Keaton being a transvestite. You might have heard people argue that there's a distinction between gender and sex. Sex, they argue, is biology, whereas gender is a social construct. And a lot of Christians and conservatives will balk at that, but it's not entirely nonsense. If I were to say women have long hair and men have short hair, that's a gendered statement, and it's an accurate statement about distinctions between males and females in our culture. But it's not a biological statement. There's nothing biologically that necessitates that women have long hair. There's nothing biologically that necessitates that men have short hair, unless they're going bald. Hello darkness, my old friend. Women have long hair and men have short hair is an accurate gender statement about distinctions between men and women in our culture. But women can have short hair. Men can have long hair. Girls can play with trucks. Boys can like the color pink. That might be a deviation from the gender norms, but it doesn't strike me as a violation of the created order, which I think is the driving force behind their prohibition in Deuteronomy. The issue is when we start to cast aside the creative order and claim that there is no such distinction between males and females and claim that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. A boy can have long hair. That doesn't mean he's presenting as female. A girl can dress boyishly. That doesn't mean she's trying to be male. Uh, those might be disruptions of cultural gender norms, but they're not disruptions of the creative order. Just as there's a distinction between cultural conventions, which are laws we make up, like the tax code and the rules of traffic, and the moral law, which is the moral order that God decrees, there is also a difference between the cultural gender norms that we make up and the gender distinctions instituted by God. Disrupting the former can be permissible. Disrupting the latter is never permissible. All right, with that said, let's turn back to the question. What can we point to aside from Scripture? How can we argue from things like the natural law? 
I think that's a striking question, and sadly, I think it's a question that is really quite reflective of the times. That male and female are distinct and immutable categories in the Homo sapien species was not a unique or exclusive biblical claim until we all lost our collective minds about five minutes ago. Throughout all of human history, we've regarded males as distinct from females, and every single scientific discovery or material fact on Earth has confirmed that males and females are categorically and immutably different. There are biological differences. There are psychological differences. There are chemical differences. There are physiological differences. So what can we point to apart from Scripture? Well, only literally every single field relevant to the topic. Zoology? We're not the only species with male and female distinction. I can't think of a single mammal without male and female distinction. Anthropology? We can uncover the remains of bodies centuries old and know immediately whether they were male or female because of things like bone structure. Chemistry? The reason we prescribe hormone treatments to trans people is precisely because there's chemical differences between males and females. Biology? Literally every single cell in our body is a marker of whether or not we're male or female. Now some people may point to abnormalities like hermaphrodites and say, see? And yes, we, we live in a fallen world and creation gets twisted. There are certainly all kinds of naturally occurring abnormalities. But you don't define categories by abnormalities. Because if you did, not only can you not say anything definitive about male and female, you can't say anything definitive about anything. How many limbs does a homo sapien have? Well, I mean, golly gee, you know, some people are born with two arms, some people are born with one, some people are born with none, some people are born with one leg, some people lose a leg later in life. So how many limbs does a homo sapien have? Well, you know, it's a spectrum, it's, it's fluid, it's hard to say. Is it? Or are you just being obtuse? Or how about chromosomes? How many chromosomes do homo sapiens have? Well, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of chromosomal abnormalities, so we can, can't say anything really definitively. We don't define things by their abnormalities. We define abnormalities by their deviation from the natural order of things. And does anyone really believe that people like Bruce Jenner or Ellen Page have some sort of rare chromosomal issue? We can find out. I'll take that bet. The use of pronouns they, them is not only biologically incorrect, but also grammatically nonsensical unless they're conjoined twins. So my question would be, are they in fact conjoined twins? No? Shocking. So to summarize, if the question is, what can we use other than scripture to argue our position? I think the answer is, we can use literally everything that we've ever learned about the natural world as it pertains to males and females. Immutable distinction between male and female is not a uniquely Christian or biblical claim. But will the evidence of the natural world be an effective argument in this case? I think the answer is implicit in the question, which is no. You said, first of all, their arguments come from having family members that identify as they, them. Arguments being in quotes is a tell. They're not making a formal argument. They're appealing to emotion. Their position is not based on facts, science, reason, or logic, and so it seems unlikely that they would be persuaded by fact, science, reason, or logic. So then how do we address these things? It's really, really hard. You know, as Jonathan Swift said, reasoning will never make a man correct an ill opinion, which by reasoning he never acquired. But I don't want to be defeatist about this, so let me give a couple of things that can be done. Uh, the first thing I would say is don't make arguments, ask questions. It's not a rational issue, and so the tactics have to be different. In many ways, it's a psychological issue. And just like when it comes to therapy, helpful revelations or insights or solutions are much more effective if it feels like it's coming internally. A good therapist could spot any given issue in maybe just one session, but they can't just blurt out, here's your problem, here's what you need to do, because most likely that'll just be rejected. So the therapeutic approach can be to talk it out and ask probing questions to lead them to come to the realization on their own, seemingly. I think the same sort of approach is helpful, asking probing questions. What is a woman? Define what a woman is. Now, that can come off as a bit trolly, but questions like that are helpful to get them to wrestle with their internal logic. I would define a woman as this, but that clearly doesn't fit with what you're saying, so how do you define a woman? Their position is totally incoherent, so we need to inflict them with the emotional toll of wrestling with their incoherence. 
And hopefully that will jar them and snap them out of their madness. And some of these questions, I think, might be more helpful if they were not specifically directed at correcting their mistakes, but were directing them to God. The Spirit of God is the ultimate transformative power. And I think there's a natural inroad there with transgender issues because transgenderism is really in conflict with metaphysical naturalism. The claim is, my body is not the real me. Well, that's not materialism. That's not naturalism. Naturalism and materialism suggest that the physical is all there is. So how can you say that you're not your body? Your body is all you are. Claiming that I'm in the wrong body or that my body is not the real me, that doesn't make sense under naturalism. It is to suggest that you are more than just physical, that there is something in you that is immaterial, that you're spirit or soul. Do we have spirits? Do we have souls? What's the implication from that? What happens to our souls when we die? How do we get these spiritual selves? God can transform hearts and minds better than we can. So even if there's no progress on this issue, maybe it's a way that you can still guide them toward Christ. The second thing I think we can do, I talked about in episode 24, thinking beyond doublethink, which was all about how to reach people in a post-truth, post-fact world. And that's to tell stories. Their love and their experience with a particular person is clouding their thinking on this issue. So we can approach it the same way. There's no shortage of stories. There's no shortage of accounts of people who transitioned and came to deeply regret it, whose lives were not benefited from buying our current cultural madness, but who suffered unbelievable pain and anguish and despair because of this lie. Those true stories and true experiences hit people on the same sort of emotional level and it does change the way people think of these things. And we need to be sharing those stories, telling those stories, making movies and television with stories dealing with those kinds of issues. Why aren't Christians doing that? I think it might be helpful to do that in order to, you know, appropriate the culture. Well, with that crushing morosity, we'll wrap things up. Thanks for the question. If you have questions, you can reach me on my author's Facebook page, on Twitter and Locals, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriating the Culture.